Hi guys, Jamie Humphries here for Six String Alliance and today's quick riff, we are taking a look at Mother Don't Wanna Go To School Today by Xtreme. <laughs> So before we get into today's lesson, I have to apologize for my voice. Uh, I am a little bit croaky and a little bit nasally because uh, I have a bit of a bad cold and I didn't want to miss a week of filming content. I've been away on holiday. I officially turned old. I turned 50 last week, so I had a bit of a break and uh, came back and I've got sick. So uh, I didn't want to miss a week of filming content. For those of you that are worried, I don't think it's anything sinister, but I did actually do the COVID test today, which was actually worse than the cold itself. So uh, I sound a little bit like Dot Cotton at the moment. For you English viewers, you will know exactly what I mean, a little bit gruff sounding. So forgive me for that, but that hopefully won't take away from the fun pack lesson that I have for you today. So I wanted to take a look at a riff by Nuno Betancourt, and I wanted to look at something that has the Van Halen effect. I keep mentioning this on my channel and looking at riffs and looking at ways that Eddie Van Halen has inspired other great guitar players. And this is an excellent example of Eddie's influence on Nuno's playing. Now, Nuno is a fantastic guitar player, and this track is taken from the debut album by Extreme. Now, I bought Paul graffiti on import before its general release in the UK. A buddy of mine had bought it and uh, got me into it. Uh, at the time, I was really into Living Colour. I was listening to Stevie Salas. I was listening to, who else? Dan Reed Network. A lot of those kind of slightly funk-inspired rock bands. And he was like, you've got to check this band out. And I was totally blown away. So I then hunted down the first album and uh, there was a little uh, record shop in Maidstone called uh, The Long Player. And I used to go in there and order up all these crazy import albums, the extreme stuff. I used to get all my shrapnel stuff with the Jason Becker and Richie Cotts and stuff. And uh, this album was quite a different sound to Pornography. It was a little bit lighter in terms of its guitar tone. And maybe the songs weren't quite as strong, but there's some absolute stonkers on this album, including Play With Me, which obviously is uh, from the Bill and Ted soundtrack. Other standout tracks on the album also include Kid Ego, which has a fantastic riff. Now, I was a massive Nuno Betancourt fan and uh, was one of those slightly uh, snobbish kids that was, I was into these first before uh, Get The Funk Out and More Than Words here. In fact, just sitting down here next to me, I found this. I have my old, I'll put it there. Hopefully you guys can see that. I have my old extreme concert program. I went to the porno graffiti tour. Now this would have, I think this was 1991. I'm sure it mentions more than words in this program. Just flicking through, there's uh, uh, some really cool pictures. Let's find this a nice uh, page of uh, Nuno stuff going on there. And uh, yeah. That's a little bit of uh, rock memorabilia there. That's a cool picture of the band, if I just turn that around. There you go. But uh, yeah, I was one of those really uh, geeky people that always bought uh, concert programs. And I normally put the ticket stub in there, but for some reason I didn't. So looking at this track, tonally it's quite different from Porno Graffiti. Now Porno Graffiti, Nuno was well documented for using the ADA preamps. And at this point he was using the Washburn guitars, most famously his N4 guitar, but there's different versions of it. I'm not too sure on the exact history of the guitar. I know I've seen early photos and videos of him playing ones with 
N2 on it on the uh, Mother video, the official video. He's playing an unfinished guitar, which looks like a Washburn. I'm assuming it's a Washburn that has the N2 logo on it. But this album was recorded on Nuno's Frankenstrat, which was, uh, I think it was a Schecter body. It's a black guitar, and he's carved out the uh, the bottom horn. There was a lot of uh, alterations he made to it, and I think it has a Warmoth neck on it as well. Now, he used these, I believe it's Seymour Duncan pickups in the bridge and the Bill Lawrence pickups in the neck on the uh, later guitar on the N4. I'm not sure whether that was the pickups that he was using. Some of you can probably uh, shed a little bit more light on this. Like I said in, uh, in, in my uh, Kramer video recently, I'm not much of a cork sniffer. I'm a little bit more about the, uh, the playing side of things. But this album album was recorded using a Marshall amplifier and famously a rat pedal. So let's talk a little bit about the gear that I'm using today. I'm using my 1993 Ernie Ball Music Man EVH signature model. I was going to use my Frankie. I was a little bit torn between using a Strat style guitar in honour of Nuno, but uh, I'm a big Music Man user. As you guys know, I've been using Music Man now for 23 years and we haven't had a Music Man guitar in here for a while. I've been mixing it up and using some other stuff. So obviously these are uh, my guitar of choice. These are my main guitars. I'm running into some pedals today. I'm using a Wampler Ratsbane pedal. I've got the gain set quite low and uh, I'm driving that into the amp. We'll talk about the amp in a second. I'm also using an MXR EVH flanger and I've got the EVH button switched in, which is that uh, EVH preset for the unchained flanger setting. I'm running into my mini rec, my Mesa mini rec. I'm on channel two I'm using the vintage mode but I've got the gain quite low but I'm using the uh the, the, the rat's bane to boost that a little bit. Nuno famously has the gain down, but pushes the level a little bit more. So he was using the rat pedal more as a boost. So I'm trying to emulate that to, uh, to, to, to some point. I'm using the original captor today, Two Notes captor. There's a reason why I'm coming out of that and going straight into my Mac and I'm using wall of sound as opposed to using either captor or cab clone where the, the uh, impulse responses are already loaded in to the hardware. Now, the reason being is that I'm using the brand new uh, George Lynch signature pack of Dyne IRs that uh, Two Notes have just released this week. Now, the reason why I wanted to use these, not only was it just to give a little bit of a shout out to my good friends at Two Notes, because these IRs are absolutely fantastic. And George Lynch has a, uh, a rather wonderful collection of vintage cabinets. But also, there is a, a cabinet in here which was actually owned by Eddie Van Halen that uh, George Lynch bought. It was one of those cabs that had all the covering stripped off. And in the top, it has some uh, JBL speakers. And in the bottom, it has some Celestian speakers, which was that famous sound that Eddie got on the first couple of uh, Van Halen albums. So I wanted to use that cabinet because it has such a, uh, a distinct eddy sound. You do actually get two impulse responses. You have uh, VH1 and VH2, and one of the cabinets has the JBLs. They've uh, made an impulse response of the JBLs, and the other one has the Celestians. So hence why I'm using the Wall of Sound software, so I can have both of those uh, Dyn IRs open using different microphones on them and then blending them together to help me get Get that distinctive tone. Now I've mentioned the Van Halen effect. Uh, this track really does borrow heavily from Unchained with the chord riff, the drop tuning, and even the use of the flanger. Obviously Nuno was giving a massive uh, uh, tip of the hat, a massive nod to one of his huge heroes, Eddie Van Halen. Uh, also, uh, there's a massive nod to Brian May with the uh, the chord progression that follows the introduction. Now, yes, this song does feature an incredible guitar solo at the front end. I did consider looking at this. Uh, I don't know whether I'd be able to play it. I've learned parts of it before, and it will probably take quite a bit of practice for me to get anywhere near being able to do that. But obviously, the main focus here was learning the riff. So let's just mention the tuning. We're in drop D tuning, but the guitar is dropped down to E flat. So everything's down by a semitone. So let's uh, run through the strings quickly, starting from the sixth string all the way to the first string. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, so let's have a look at the first part of the riff. This is one of those riffs that really relies on the kind of tightness of the right hand being able to play between different string groups. Nuno is so accurate. It is unbelievable. It's not a particularly fast tempo. I think we're around 93 or 94 BPM for this track, but he's playing 16th note subdivisions. So it's a little bit... Um, a little bit taxing on your picking hand, but also you've got to jump between playing these uh, two note chords on the G and the B string and then playing that uh, muted, that palm muted sixth string in between. So it's really important for you to practice these riffs nice and slowly and gradually build them up because you've got to get that cleanliness. You don't want to be hitting other strings. You've got to keep it really tight sounding. Now, something else that we need to pay attention to is the position of the riff on the beat. Now, although I'd learned sections of this riff previously, uh, I'd never really studied it to any great sort of detail. I, I could just play bits of the riff basically from when, when I was younger, just jamming along with the record. But one of the things to really look at here is where the riff comes in. Now, I'd always imagined that that, it always felt to me, should I say, that the two uh, mutes that you hear that at the front end, da -da 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 -da, when the riff comes in, I always heard those, uh, those mutes as being on the end of four. So one, two, three, four, da -da 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 which uh, was obviously very wrong. <laughs> when I started studying this, I was like, hang on a minute, uh, I'm not playing this right. So you actually come in with the mutes on one. So one, two, three, four, -da 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 -da. so the chords come in on the end of one. So you're going to start off by barring with your first finger on the G and the B strings at the seventh fret. So you get this. So you've got those two little uh, mutes. And then you're playing seven on the G and the B with your first finger. And then you're adding your second finger on the eighth fret of the B. So one, two, three, four. Then we're dropping down to the sixth string and we're playing a 16th note palm muted figure on that string, that open string, but using the palm muting to keep it tight. And then on the beat four, we're doing this. So you're going between that D sus and back to D, so down, up, down, up. So let's put that together, sounds like this. Now that's the, the important thing there is, you know, the position of the riff on the, uh, on, on, in relationship to the groove. So for the next part of the riff, we're really referencing Brian May here, and uh, we're playing this G over B chord, but we're playing two on the A string. And we're doing these little palm mutes on, on just that note on that second fret uh, of the A. And then we slide the first finger up to the third fret of the A to give us the C5 chord. So you're coming out of the previous section. And then we're dropping down to an A5 chord. Got a little uh, mute on the uh, open A string. And then we're playing a D over A. So that's playing your A chords with one finger and then adding the fourth fret of the D and the third fret of the B. And that kind of thing. So again, very, very Brian May. Okay, so then we're into the next part of the riff. And this is where we're going to use the flanger. So we do the first part of the chord figure that we've seen. We've already seen that section before. I'm just kicking the flanger in down here on the floor. So... And then we have a slightly different uh, feel to the next section to accommodate the lick that comes in on beats three and four of the bar. So we have this. So you're playing those mutes on the second fret A. Sliding up to the C5 chord. Then we have our A5. And then we've got a little A major pentatonic lick here. So we're going to trying to get that pinched harmonic on the uh, on that string bend. So you're bending four up a whole tone, releasing that and pulling off to the second fret. So you get this. Then the four to two on the D string. 
and then you're playing three to open on the A and on the E string. Okay, so now let's put those sections together slowly. Here we go. <laughs> That rap pedal really helps with uh, getting that sort of bite and that honk to that uh, that little lick and uh, really makes that uh, pinched harmonic jump out. Okay, so now for the next part of the riff, we just go round the first round, basically. So we've already seen this section. So here we go. Three, four. <laughs> Okay, so then into the next section. And uh, play that much of it, so you're doing the, the chord part. And then we're playing a down up on that, uh, on that sixth string. And then we have this part. This is really hard, this. Uh, you're stretching a little finger up and playing 10 on the B whilst playing seven on the G, and then you're pedaling off of the open sixth string, which is palm muted. So the best way to do this, I found, was with all down strokes. So you play the, the 10 on the B with the seven on the G, and then you're down to eight on the B and the seven on the G, the muted open sixth, and then we play the seven on the G and the B, and as you strike it, you hammer on and pull off from the eighth fret B. And then you re-strike the chords, you get this. So it's quite a fiddly section that took, uh, took quite a lot of practice to get that up to speed. So uh, one more time, here we go. Then we drop down to an A5 chord, but we start off with the C note on the third fret of the A. We're bending into that note. You can actually hold the chord and get it's that kind of bluesy uh, sort of reference going from the minor third to the major third, although you don't quite hit that C sharp. And then we have this descending sextuplet riff. Excuse my voice here, I'm struggling to say certain words, a little bit embarrassing. Uh, it's groups of sixes, basically. So uh, you're coming down with this figure. Okay, so you pull off five to two on the top E and the B. Then we play two on the top E. Play five to two on the B. Then we play the blues note on the uh, on the uh, fifth fret of the G string. Although we're not really seeing it as the blues note in uh, in this uh, context, I guess. Um, what would that be? It's a uh, a C note, so it's actually a minor third that you're seeing it as because we're we're thinking about it in in A. But in a familiar fingering, um, it would be F sharp minor, and that would be the blues note. But uh, in this instance, because you're playing over A major, it's a mi uh, minor third. Back to the major third, so that's that sort of clash, that slight dissonance between the C natural and the C sharp. It's a really cool sound. And then we pull off four to two. Now, I thought I could hear the uh, the fourth fret of the D uh, to finish off. I did try to include it, but you've got to get up to that uh, the D triad. So it's a little bit of a fiddly one. I just about made it on the riff. So uh, when I played on the intro, so apologies if it's not exact, but uh, it's along these lines. I'm sure you guys will be able to get it a little bit better than I have got it in my feverish state. So here we go. <laughs> You don't have to play that last note. You uh, let's put it together. So, and that's if you finish on the second fret, which I think I did on the performance, because then you've got to get up to that D triad at the seventh fret. Okay, so before we move on to the next section, let's put that first section together nice and slowly. Here we go.
So now we're on to the verse section, and there's some huge nods to Brian May. So we're getting Brian May and Van Halen references in one fantastic tune. But this riff is undeniably Nuno. It is so hard. You've got this recurring melodic theme based around the chords with these tight palm muted uh, root notes. Start off with that D triad on the seventh fret of the D, G, and B. Slide that away because you're using the first finger, and then we play it again with the second finger playing the root because that aids you in being able to play this figure. We've got that sus chord on seven on the G, eight on the B. Now back down to the D on seven on the G and the B. And you're putting the 16th note on that uh, 7th fret D in between. Then we drop down to this A triad. Well, well, we're playing a dyad, I should say. We're only playing two notes, so that's 6 on the uh, G and 5 on the B. Back up to 7 on the G and the B. So you get this. And then we have this little figure where you're playing six on the G and seven on the B. You go down up on the uh, on those two strings, and then you play a muted seven on the D string, and then another upstroke. So you get, and then back to the muted seventh fret D, and then you're doing that same recurring figure. And uh, this is the tricky part with it, because you've got to keep this root note in between. So it's the same chord figure. Then we drop down to five on the uh, G string and seven on the uh, B string, but we're borrowing across seven on the D as well. So you get this. <laughs> which uh, uh, introducing that G note. And then you're adding your little finger on the eighth fret of the B. So again, you are referencing that original melody. And then we have this little, little hammer on pull off. So that's five on the G and the B. Strike the chord, hammer seven and pull off. And re-strike it. So that is really hard. Let me play that whole section slowly. You can download the tab and follow exactly what's going on there. It is a little bit of a, a finger twister to try and explain and play, but it's one of those things that once you sort of put it together, it, uh, it makes more sense. So... <laughs> More up to speed. Three, four. You see what I mean? It's a really fiddly part to play uh, to keep it clean, keep the, the mutes on the root notes, but let the chord really ring out. It's a great exercise for your picking hand. Okay, so then we drop down to this. So that's that uh, C note again on the A string. And we're playing an A5, and then we're hammering onto that D over A chord. So we come out of this section. So then we jump up to an E5 power chord. Now this part's really hard as well to get the phrasing right. You're sort of raking across the uh, strings. You're playing only a two note power chord. And then we have these uh, double pick. And then you're adding your third finger on nine on the A. And then you drop down to a B chord, because you've got the D sharp in the root, and there you have to put some vibrato on it. So you're going from that tightness of the palm muted chord to the openness of the chord with the vibrato. So one more time, go like this. So we're 
we're on the B chord. And there you're going between the uh, sixth fret A and the seventh fret A. Then we drop down to the D5 chord. And we do that same figure, but going between five and seven on the A. So put all of it together. Then we drop down to a B5 power chord. So after that B5 power chord, we then play a B triad on the fourth fret D, G, and B. And as we strike it, we hammer on to the sixth fret of the D and the fifth fret B to give us an E over G sharp. There's an E chord with the G sharp on the bass. And then we're back to that B triad. Power chord, B5 power chord. And then you're into the D5, which leads us into the chorus. Okay, so now let's play through the verse progression nice and slowly. Like I said, this is a bit of a finger twister, this one. This is not easy, but it's a great rhythm workout. Here we go. <laughs> So I, again, I might be playing some of the rhythms a little bit different from the performance once you kind of break it down and slow it down a bit. But, uh, you know, as I said, I'm all about playing it, not ex examining every single little, uh, little nuance. Obviously, that's down to the personal style of the individual player. Okay, so now we're going to put the two sections together and play it nice and slowly. Here we go. Three, four. <laughs> Okay, so there you have it. Hopefully you enjoyed this riff. Great example of the Van Halen effect. I love seeing Eddie Van Halen's inspiration on other great guitar players. And there is no doubt that Nuno is an absolute monster of a player. I think we need to look at some more Nuno. I've always fancied breaking down the middle section to Cupid's Dead. Maybe that would be an absolute, well, wouldn't really be a quick riff anymore, would it? But maybe we should take a look at that because that is absolutely fantastic. Also, there's a big nod to Brian May. So Brian and Eddie in one track and Nuno, of course, obviously. So a pretty cool lesson, I think. So hope you enjoyed the lesson. Click the link below, download the free Guitar Pro and the PDF of the tab. And I'll look forward to seeing you here again when hopefully I don't sound quite as croaky and uh yeah i'm sure everything's okay those of you writing or writing comments have you got covid or anything i'm sure it's nothing weird but i have done the test anyway so uh that's it from me see you next time bye for now